Our first time I've gotten to sit down and do a pod with Sharon Shravatsa, and it's long overdue. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know Sharon by now, you're missing out. I have said this on multiple podcasts that in the last 12, 15 months, I'll even say, because it was 2022, we're here in the end of quarter one, you're about to speak at Turn On. So the last 15 months, the single best executive hire in the real estate industry is when Tamir plucked you and said, hey, come join me at Real. And I listen, I think you, you're probably going to get to a point where you're making all the decisions there. I, I'm not going to yeah. put words in your mouth. Yeah. Um, but it was such a brilliant hire by Tamir. Seeing like, okay, how can we really grow this thing? Let's bring in somebody that's well-respected, that can see around corners, that's you, uh, and that's going to help drive this ship and be the leader. And so I, I'm just... Blown, I was blown away by the hire. I'm still blown away by what you're doing. Cause it's like, man, Sharon, I didn't see a lot of you, you know, the, you know, maybe the last few years before the hire. Now I'm seeing you everywhere. And I'm like, the industry needs yeah. your messaging. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. I, when a big part of this was after we sold the business to Douglas Elliman, you know, I, there was a five year non-compete. So I respected yeah. that non-compete and, and we spent a lot of that time being investors and it was great. But a big part of that, I actually wrote a business plan for what it would look like if I had to start a brokerage all over again. And a big part of the 80 to 90% of that plan, when I walked in and I presented at Real, it was exactly Real. And so I showed Tamir that. I was like, this is the plan that I wrote. And that was the beginning of our conversations. And, and just seeing the plan already come to life, as opposed to having to go through the startup phase of getting it there, just felt like a calling more than and anything else. I think people don't realize how long Real's been around, yeah. right? Because Real's been nine what, years. Nine years. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say almost ten years. So yeah, nine years, which is interesting. Um, nine years, nine thousand agents. Yeah. I'd I'd imagine, and it takes you know that's the foundation, right? So obviously you know we're, when we talk about the J curve, that there's an acceleration there. I'd imagine that your number in your head for the next nine months or 19 months is doubling that or tripling that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the vision. The vision is um, if we can't get to at least 10% of the licensed agent population in the United States, we're missing something. And there's mm -hmm. a reason for that. Every For most people, it is hitting the number of 150,000 agents. For me, it's not hitting the number of 150,000 agents. It is actually getting 150,000 agents on our platform so we can actually learn what agents really need in the new world. That is what I'm most interested in. And the interesting part for a lot of people is I just want to get the agent count growth at all costs. But for us, getting to the 150,000 agents is super powerful because now I get to see what agents do. The crazy part though, Byron, is we are probably one of the only companies to have a 100% platform adoption. So you have to get paid. You have to use our platform to get paid. Mm -hmm. So I know everything that an agent does. And that's really powerful for us in the last couple of years because I can see every single split, every single transaction, every single referral, how people do it, why they do it. So our internal data is you know, like a mini Zillow. Yeah. And having like 10 Because we know it's 10% of most, like adoption of platform for most brokerages is 10% of the agents. Correct. But for us to say we have 100% adoption, now we can actually run a data-oriented company to do the right thing by the agent and the consumer. That is what's most exciting to me. I listened to Tamir speak at T360 yeah. last year. I think his number was higher than 10%, but I don't think he was just talking about real. I think he was talking about just these, these types of models. Mm -hmm. um, overall and i think it was like 350,000 he had a certain time frame uh of the 1.5 million which would be more than 10% right because yeah. you're talking about 100, 150,000 yeah um will you be at T360 this year side I'm, note yep I'm, i think good. so yeah good cuz so, cuz we're we're here this is the first time anybody's ever done this marks a visionary right yeah. where we're doing this like in the lobby uh, lot, you know, podcast. This one's not live. We're, we're gonna, but we're gonna do a very quiet one at T360 <laughs> in my hometown of Naples. Yep. So uh, definitely stay tuned for that. Part two of the Sharon Dude. podcast in 2023. Kind, you, you agree to that? I am. I'm in. I'm All in. Right, good. I get more time with you, buddy. We. I, I agree with that. All right. Tim Macy's getting jealous right now. T Tim's like, don't corrupt Sharon, okay? Because you know I want this real. Can I say EXP? Am I allowed to say EXP you can say on, whatever, the, yeah. on the podcast? Sure. This real EXP say debate? You want. Yeah. I want the debate. And, and hear me out. Let me pitch this to you. Yeah. Okay, you're going to be Kevin O'Leary or, or whoever you like on Shark Tank, and I'm pitching this to you. Cuban. 
Um, you want to be Mark Cuban? Okay, Sharon's Mark Cuban. I'm this somebody looking for, for a yes. I want to see an, uh, a real versus EXP debate, long form conversation on the BAM platform, because I, I want to put the two models side by side so that if, hey, if, we're, if you're going to get to 150,000, that 90 plus percent of agents who have never seen yeah, sure. the platform at all, and you're getting a lot of people in, into your Zooms, and Sharon's doing a lot of great educational content, so you should check that out. But there's a whole bunch of agents that haven't even looked at it. And so I want to put them side by side on a neutral playing field. Tim Macy keeps telling me, no. What does Sharon say? Should, should the agent, will the agent community win? If we put it all out there side by side, and I know what Tim has said to me, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you say. So I, I, I have two kind of big thoughts around this. The first is the days of economics, a platform, what the company offers, et cetera, being held behind closed doors is over. Yeah. I remember even when we were running TELUS, we had, you know, we grew 10x in five years. It was a great run for us, but we had a lot of stated deals and special deals. We had a lot of economics in one stated in one hand, but side agreements here. We some were offered some people some weren't offered and there was no uniformity of offering in a lot of ways. But I think it would benefit the agent and eventually the consumer if companies can just come out and say, here's our model. Mm -hmm. There's there's nothing like, oh Byron, here's our model, but I'll give you something else. And and I yeah. think just state the model so that we can all plan well. So that's my kind of my first comment. The second is, you are the media expert, whether it may be side by side or whether it may be in a different way. What I have seen is even when I do Zooms talking about the real model, we get we max out Zoom every time. So You max out. I'm going to push back there because Sharon maxes out Zoom. Um, I would say that over before you got you know 8,000 agents, 9,000 agents, there's a lot of agents that do a Zoom and maybe they get 20, 30 people. They're, they're, listen, people yeah. are showing up to your Zoom, right. you're maxing it out at 1,000 because people want to hear from Sharon. And I get that. Um, but not every agent at real can draw that type of sure. audience. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I think as, you, as we Zoom out, I think it is important for all agents since we have 93% of agents in the traditional model, whatever the traditional model yeah. is, it's important for agents to feel like they know what their options are. I always tell our team, when you don't know your options, you don't have any. And knowing options is really important. So whether it may be, you know, kind of the, the Tims or the Jeremy Knights of the world who have seen the options across the board, having them share what the options are is really important. So I'm a big fan of whatever it takes to provide transparency into a model. I, I'd be the first one to say, hey, here's, I want to show you everything, including the things that are not built out, including the things that are just visionary, including the things that we are on the way to get there. Because I think showing that we are a work in progress is a really powerful thing because it keeps me accountable to building good stuff in the future. Have you ever listened to the podcast Startup by Gimlet Media? Of course. Yeah. yeah. And Chris Smith actually turned me on to it. He's like, how have you not listened to this podcast? You guys are growing a media company. You've never listened. I went back to like 2014. And it's their whole journey of like launching Gimlet Media before they sold to Spotify. And what you just said right there reminds me of that, like showing the actual journey, yeah. the mistakes, or you know, here's where we think we can go, and then maybe 15 months of data, now we've adjusted that and we don't think we can get there, maybe we're gonna get there a different way. Um, and so I'd love to see more of that. Well, I'd love to see more of that. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, right? In, especially in today's financial market, which you do an amazing job of taking complex news, breaking it down so that agents can get that and actually share it with their clients. What people, what, what I spend a lot of my time looking at is I look at at-risk content, meaning who are the people that are actually doing the research and dogfooding their own research? So for mm -hmm. example, I was a banker at Goldman Sachs. The Goldman Sachs research team's entire job was to put out research for Goldman to invest their own private capital. And yeah. so they were saying, hey, here's what we believe the economy is gonna be. Whether you like it or not, Byron and Sharon, we're doing this because we have at-risk capital when it's associated with this. Ray Dalio, who used to run Bridgewater, is exactly yeah. the same thing. Whatever he believes, he's they're doing in their hedge fund. And I think that the reason why BAM and what you and Eric do is so important is because what you're learning, you're doing. Right? And that's super powerful. You're dogfooding your own content. It's not 
uh, there's, there's accountability to the rhetoric. You're saying something and you're standing by it. You're saying, hey, local market people need to know this, therefore you should do local market green screens. You're telling them what to do and you're doing the same thing. And I think in the next 18, 24 months, it's gonna start weeding out folks that have no accountability content. They just say, oh yeah, it's gonna be this way, the talking heads, it's gonna be this way, right? And that's really, really hard and I think let me tell you our difference. This right? is something I've been on for a while. I love that you just went there. Dude, the reason is, like on our team, I love being public. I love being publicly traded because we have a market model. Yeah. And our market model, in we have an assumption of where the market's going to go, what the rates are going to be, uh, what changes in volume and days on market's going to be. Like the one of the, I'll, I'll tell everybody, one of the key things that drive our market model is days on market. People don't realize that days on market is the single most important thing that we all see. If you start seeing extensions in days on market, you'll start seeing lower in volume just because it takes longer to sell stuff. But we run our business and our projections, what we report to the street, all based on our market model. So when I say, here's our research, it's not just Sharon thinking about something, it's we're banking and betting our company's next quarter results, the next half of the year results on it. So when people are listening to BAM or Real or Goldman or Ray Dalio, I think we should look for accountability-based content because I'd say eight out of 10 people have zero accountability-based content right now. Wow, I say it a different way. I say there's a contagion happening in our industry where people are just getting on stage and just spouting out whatever they think sounds right about the next marketing hack. And like then every then it's like creating this loop of insanity where it's like, oh, well, I want to get on stage, so I'm going to pay to travel here to get on stage because I think I'm going to get a, a paid speaking gig. And they're just going in this loop of just like losing money instead of focusing on, on the main thing. And to your point, you said it much better than I did, dog fooding your own content. Your own content. We're like, And this is what we've been talking about with Bam, like wait till we just show everybody the ins and outs of what we're doing with the newsletter, like behind the scene. We've been doing that with a lot of the social stuff, but we want to do it with it absolutely everything, everything. Yeah. and show the entire journey along the way because everything we're doing at BAM is what the local team can do on their business. These eBooks, we probably have a whole bunch linked down below. Building your brand right now is more important than ever with the lawsuit that is looming in the real estate industry and how that could change commissions. Your brand needs to be tight. Your ability to market to consumers directly and showcase your value must be paramount. You must excel over other agents. It's why we've put out eBooks like the one down below, Mastering the Green Screen. It tells you everything you need to do with green screen recording on Instagram, on TikTok, which gives you the most organic growth right now. The bigger you can build your brand, the more value to the marketplace you can provide, and the higher fees ultimately you will be able to validate. Get the eBook down below, Mastering the Green Screen today, so you can start building your brand like bam, the eBooks, the free eBooks, it's a great way for the local uh, brokerage or the local team or the local agent to go and connect with people by offering something of value, getting them to download yeah. and then having a conversation. Dude, I'll, I'll tell you, um, so this past weekend, I was in a, I was in a listing appointment with one of our agents to help our agents. You went on a listing I went appointment. On a listing Sharon appointment. went on a listing appointment. And, tell and, me more. So it's one of my favorite things to do. I've been on hundreds of these but the interesting part we went on this appointment it was seven million dollar listing we were the third person in the room and we won the listing in 20 minutes and the interesting part is i sat back in the car with the agent and the agent told me he's like i didn't even care that we won the listing what i want is this time with you to debrief that is the most important thing because most agents have never had an, uh, an external pair of eyes who has seen so many yeah. different things inside behind closed doors. They've never had that. When you and I and Tom Tool are calling, uh, there are other people in the bullpen that are listening to our conversation. But inside the listing appointment, no one has ever had any perspectives. Right. So when we sat there and we debriefed that appointment, he just said to me, he goes, I learned more in this 20 minute debrief than I learned in 18 years of selling real estate. And that's what's super cool. And dude, here's the crazy part. We didn't open one piece of material. Right? And I'm not saying you had to do that. Did you bring material? We brought material. Right, so, so how did you win the appointment? And then what did the agent learn in the debrief? Yeah, so that's a, this is actually the core of my presentation today. So I'll, I'll, I'll take you through There's three big pieces. And I say, number one, find the truth. Number two, organize the complexity. And number three, activate the future. Finding the truth is a lot of times we say, they'll tell you, oh, I'm interested in price. I'm interested in commission. I'm interested in how long this is gonna take to sell. And then we ask them like, why? They'll go to the logical components of saying, Oh, because uh, how long will it take me to sell my home? All you agents are exactly the same, et cetera. 
that's good, it's logical, but they've, you've not gotten to the feelings yet. Mm -hmm. So a big part of this is the iceberg of getting to the truth. If you can't get to the truth, you have no way on how to actually prepare for the presentation. So until we get to the truth, we can't even do much from that. And I'll give you the simplest of things. The number one thing an agent can do in a listing appointment that will dramatically increase their chances of winning is not to do the tour first. Okay. Because you walk in the door, here's what, walk in, knock, knock, oh my gosh, I love your house. You ski in Aspen, I ski in Aspen too. Oh, would you like a tour? Oh, oh, oh let me get a tour. They're like you're trying to take off your shoes, trying to get a tour. On the entire tour that you take on, on this home, your Byron's head is behind me. I have no rapport. And yeah. after I start doing the tour, you start asking questions. Oh, have you seen that house? Have you seen this house? Our kitchen's better. And you have no rapport and you have to answer all these questions. And by the time you come back and ready to sit down, what happens? You've put yourself in a defensive position. hundred percent. Okay. The key thing that an agent should walk in and say, hey, Byron, great to see you. Where can we sit down and strategize? That's it, mm -hmm. right? Cut. You don't need the tour because we all know that we don't need the tour right away. We just need a good plan. And then when the conversation takes a break, when the conversation energy changes, use the energy change to then take the tour. Mm. And I always tell the agents, instead of taking the tour as just because you want to see the house, take the tour intentionally. So the way I always tell people to take the tour is when you see the energy and the lull drop in the, in the appointment, say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'd love to uh, take a tour of the house, but I want to do it in two ways. First, I'd love for you to walk me through so that I can see how you live here and why it's good for you. But after that, I want to walk it through by myself yeah. to see what a buyer would see overall. But when you frame that, that is significantly better than walking in and taking the tour, which is as a no consequence tour. Yeah. And so where can you sit down and strategize actually allows you to pull out what they want. That is the first four words that should, like where can you sit down and strategize? Five words, that's what should come out of your mouth because it doesn't matter what they say. Now at least you are in rapport with them as opposed to waiting till you get to that point and then you don't have to struggle with all the other questions that you're gonna get on the tour. On this appointment that you just went on, did you guys even do the tour? No, nope, no 20 tour. 20 minutes, no boom, tour. strategize, turned into an agreement. An agreement, yep, wow. no, no tour. And the interesting part is he said, all he wanted was he was moving to Scottsdale. He's like, hey, all I want is a plan. I was like, great, let's do the plan. When do you need to be in Scottsdale? How long is it going to take? So his truth was simple. It was more. It was less complex than maybe some situations. And you're going to have that. The more listing appointments you go on, you're going to find somebody that's just like, I've got a simple goal. It's to get to Scottsdale. That's it. And the interesting part is they'll tell you if you just ask them. Right? They'll just tell you. And most people, they know we're going to market the property. But if we spend 80% of our time talking about marketing, we actually minimize our skills in other areas. We minimize mm -hmm. our skills and able to coordinate all the resources. We minimize our skills and be able to negotiate. We minimize our skills and able to get timing right. We minimize our skills in being able to do contractual stuff. The more we talk about marketing the appointment, the more we minimize our skills and our impact in every other component. Yeah. When the client already knows that we're gonna market, we're actually telling them stuff that they already know. They expect it anyway. And the things that they expect mm -hmm. Zillow, spending time on that, it, you're going to really put yourself just in a box with everybody else where it's like, hey, here are the, you know, list them out. Yeah. Here are the things that we do on top of what everybody else is going to do. Professional photographer, blah, yeah. blah, 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 right? Here's our list of things that are going to get more uh, exposure yeah. on your property, the plan. Yeah, right? exactly. And then to your point, all the other things that they may not realize. And the way to do that is also uh, anytime, anytime you want to separate from the competition, you got to brand the competition. Right? right, here's what they all do, we do it too. Here's what the average agent does, and here's what we do. So if you yeah. keep referring to the average agent, it makes that, that and you say, on oh, the average agent does what I call, of course, marketing. Well, of course we do the brochures. Of course we put it on the MLS, yeah. of course we do that. Next time the average agent walks in the room and says, we do, oh, we put it on the MLS, we have an 87 point marketing plan, you do that, they're like, oh, Sharon said that's of course marketing, so it puts them in that bucket. Yeah. We've got to brand the problem, otherwise they'll never see you separate from the solution in any way. What you just articulated is something, like you said, very few can. So what did the debrief look like? So the, 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 every time when I think the debrief was like, hey, um, he wanted to do the tour first, Mm. Now, and I cut the tour off, and he's like, why did you do that, right? It was probably so foreign to that agent. Right. And the second thing that we talked about was he's like, I drew a mind map, and I'll tell you about this for a second. When we talk to a client about something, they have a lot in their head. And so I start mind mapping it on a piece of paper, and my goal, Byron, is to fill that sheet with so much stuff that it freaks them out. And I call, and, and I call it silent overwhelm. I wanted to say, you do this, you're going to pricing. We don't know what we're going to price it at. There's a list price, there's a sales price, there's a negotiated price. Then we're going to negotiate more. So I draw, I draw out this mind map and it looks like a chicken scratch mind map. And they look at it and they, they're like, that's a lot. I want them to say that's a lot because that is silent overwhelm. And once they get overwhelmed, now you can present a, hey, let me tell you how we do it. And he was like, why did you do that mind map? 
And I said, I wanted them to see so much complexity in the process. And the phrase I gave him was, showcase the complexity, but deliver the simplicity. Mm. You got it. You can't just say, oh, we take care of it all for you. If you do that, then they just minimize what you do. But if you showcase all that complexity on that mind map, they're like, wow, there is so much. But Sharon's going to do all this for me. Now I understand. So you're not afraid to lean into their fears a little bit, which can seem confusing and complex in this whole bundle of problems and issues. You're not afraid to lean into that. You, we should. We have to create. I agree. We have to create silent overwhelm because most of the consumers don't know how to talk about this pain, this fear, this frustration. This they don't. They have no idea because they don't do it on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't yeah. have language for their concerns, fears, frustrations, and aspirations. And the more they see it visually, the more they realize that you can help them. There's this great quote that says, when you can define the problem better than your client, they automatically assume that you have the solution. Yes. And like, dude, that is what motivates me every time. I'm like, how can I define this problem better than what the client is seeing? And they're like, oh my gosh, he understands. They should be thinking he understands. As soon as they think he understands, we have won. This is part of what I'm going to be talking about today. You have a lot of agents that are like, well, oh, I'm not in, you know, reading the headlines. I'm just, I'm just only focused on the basics. But then you end up using 1980s talking points, which is it's always a good time to buy because it's real estate. It's, it's, it's an asset. And you just repeat the same thing over and over and over again instead of leaning into those headlines, leaning into the fear that's out there that most of your consumers are absorbing every single day and knowing it better than they do. Yeah, dude. You, you did a video recently and you talked about um, not just providing solutions, I'm probably paraphrasing this, not just providing solutions, but the consumer does not know the options that are available to them. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's market, more than any other market, the, the agent has to show up not with a solution mindset like they used to, but with an option mindset. And say, yeah. Byron, we have three options. Let me walk you through what this looks like. House A is 850,000, but you can get this amount of loan. We can probably get a seller carry back, but there's no concessions. House B is this amount of loan. House C is this amount, but house B and C, they're in a better school district, but house A has a better commute. Based on all of this, let's see what we can tweak in each one of these to make this a win for you. Now, you're in an option-based conversation and you're already the advisor as opposed to yeah. being a solution-based conversation, right? That's and right. I think in a shifting market, we are, we are forced to be more option-oriented because then the client's like, oh, Byron gave me all the options. If you sit down with your financial planner, they're not going to say, hey, you retire at 65 and give you one plan. They're going to say, well, if you want to retire at 59, this is what we need to do to get there. But this is what it would look like at 65. Yeah. And right. And if you really want to put in, in you 55, lay on a beach, this is what we need to do between now and then. And they're going to give you those options and they're going to start to tweak the plan accordingly based off of what you want the end outcome yeah. to be. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the, so the, the second part of the, the first part of the debrief was not doing the tour. The second part of the debrief was this idea of silent overwhelm. The third part of the debrief was actually sh bringing the marketing to life without talking about marketing. Mm. So, for example, how'd you do it? So, um, I had, a as simple and basic as it sounds, this this agent had a auto text responder, right? So he's like, "Hey, I have a listing down the street from you," and he sh I said, "Bring a picture of the listing," and he had the sign. I said, "This seller was like, can you, can you please text that number?" So the seller texts the number instantly gets an auto text back, and we had someone in the office instantly call. Mm -hmm. So all that the, the seller did now was make a text, get a text back, and instantly get a call saying, hi, this is Byron calling from Sharon Trivasa's office. Looks like you're interested in 123 Main Street. Do you have any questions about it, or when would you like to go see it? Right? Just that, and I had them do it on speaker because I knew that call was coming. So now the seller, it brought it to life that anytime somebody inquires on that, that is what they're going to get in from a response time perspective. All agents may do that, but showing that live right. demo in the living room is so, so powerful. And, and I told him about these three things. Whenever we're presenting something, it's these three words, show, flow, or demo. You got to either show something as to mm. how it works, you got to break down the flow, or you got to demo it. If you don't show flow or demo, they don't understand. Yeah. So, but showing that the basic demo of a text and callback and a simple script from an ISA calling them back lit up the, the seller because the seller was like, that's what you're going to do when I have a sign in front of my, in my yard. And that made the process come to life for them as opposed to us saying, we have a 76 point marketing plan. On listing appointments, I used to, when we get to price, yeah. I'd say, has anybody, have you guys ever heard of the MLS? Oh yeah, we've heard of it. Have you ever been on it? Yeah. Well, no, it's only for agents. I would just exactly. take my computer out, I'd log in, 
and I'd give it to them. Yeah. I'd give them the laptop. Okay, this is how you look up, this is okay. So then you tell me the price. Basically now getting them to give me the price because they're on the MLS so and empowering good. them with what agents, no agent, they bring the, the same printed CMA and what you were talking about earlier is what I would do. Hey, I know the you know two or three agents, the average agents that you're interviewing are gonna bring you a CMA. It's gonna be 50 pages of fluff and it's gonna be look very, di they're all gonna look the same. They're all printed out. Here's where they're driving that data from. I just want you to be able to come up with your own analysis. Dude, um, if agents are still doing the CMA, you should continue to do that, but I have one tip for everybody. Instead of, if you, if you, there has never been, not once, and I've had a chance to be with hundreds of agents in a cross living group, there's never been one CMA conversation that has ever been smooth, right? Byron takes the CMA, I take the CMA, and then you just start flipping. You're like, right. that kitchen's better than my kitchen. What about this house? Yeah. It gets frustrating that way. So my suggestion always is when you're doing the CMA, do a five to 10 bullet point highlight sheet on top of it and then tab the highlights. Yeah. So now when I hand you the CMA, you can say, hey Byron, I actually went, uh, our team went and crunched all the data to figure out the right pricing range to get you the highest possible price in that range. I wanna tell you the factors that drive that, and I've highlighted that on the front, can we go through that? So now yeah. you're not gonna flip. Now I can say, hey, days on market is this, let me explain days on market. Seller's market is this, let me explain that. Three, three comps for us are this, comps means this. So now I can use the highlight sheet as opposed to flipping. Flipping, right? Yeah. And that keeps them connected to you and your expertise because when they start flipping, they're out of report, they're out yeah. of frame. So the simplest thing that we can do is do the CMA, you're gonna do the research anyway, just put a cover sheet on top with the bullet points and just go through the bullet points and then you'll get whatever pricing you want. You've inspired me when I go back, I go, I spend eight weeks every summer in Connecticut. I'm gonna be going on listing appointments with the agents up there. I am going on listing appointments because if Sharon is doing it, I should be doing it. But dude, it's the, the reason is the, the conversations that we're having in the appointments right now are completely different than the conversations I had three years ago. Yeah. They're, they're, they're very, very different. And That's right. I'll, I'll tell you one appointment, we were in this appointment this past weekend and the client tells me, <laughs> He has, dude, I, I, you're, you're a junkie, Sharon. Well, this client tells me he has an investment property in Bakersfield, California. And I was like, you have a $200,000 house in Bakersfield, California. He goes, I want to sell that. And I go, well, what's your, you know, do you have a loan on that? He's like, yeah, but 2.9% 30-year fixed. You're printing money. Yeah. And he goes, I want to sell it anyway. And I'm like, what kind of loan is it? He's like, well, it's my son, but it's an FHA. I'm like, well, we can do a subject too. He goes, what is that? So now... I have a buyer buying that property as a subject to right. taking over that 2.9% without completely off-market deal and we go both sides. Yeah. It's super powerful if you know simple creative finance things that the average agent will just stay away from. Right? Yeah. And that came up because we talked about silent overwhelm. And when he felt overwhelmed, he's like, oh my gosh, I, I know my son's feeling the same way. I'm like, why is your son feeling this way? Oh, my son's trying to sell a property in Bakersfield. Now we got the second listing because of the silent overwhelm. You're, you're probably the buyer, because you're hearing two, now. <laughs> two like, I, sub, I get a subject two on that, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's unbelievable. So, we're, we're definitely gonna do another pod later in the year, and I really appreciate it. I mean, I'm ready to like, if, if you're not ready to like hear more from Sharon, I mean, I'm almost, I think Sharon's gonna slip me a, a real, <laughs> uh, you know, contract. <laughs> Tim Macy's been working me for, uh, since the day he jumped over. Dude, it's, uh, I, I'll say this one thing. Have you ever watched any Harry Potter? Um, no, I haven't. So, very high level. But I'm sure a lot of people have, so in the comments if you have. Yeah, very high level. In Harry, Mike, I have two children, they love Harry Potter, and I think real estate's a lot like Hogwarts and Harry Potter. A lot of these new wizards, talented, yeah. they come into this, this, this house, and there's a sorting hat that you put on, and the, and the sorting hat tells you which house you go to. And I believe that a choice of the brokerage is very bio-individual these days. And so who Byron may have been ready for a real a brokerage three years ago, but now your world has changed, you've changed, you've evolved, and you may be ready for something else. And I'm a big believer that being a broker choice is a very bio-individual choice. And it is it's our job to be in service of the agent, whether they're ready today or they never will be ready. Because if we don't do that, then who's gonna do that to lift up everyone else? So Yes, I get to be in you know, this small world in real, but my commitment, my service is to make sure every other agent gets a fair shot in creating a great life for themselves. If they come to real or not, that's totally cool. And I love that you're an open book. Yes. I love that it's just like, hey, this is, whether it's 
like you just shared that story about the listening appointment. Any agent can be listening to that, and, and certainly I picked up things from that. I'm certain, and let me know in the comments if you did as well. They could be at any brokerage, and they're going to learn something from Sharon every time they consume a piece of content because you're that giving. You're that open of a book, and that's how you're going to grow this thing to be a monster. So, I appreciate you. I, I want to say one thing. I don't think people realize how much time, how much creativity, how much commitment, how much effort it takes to show up and put great content out, great ideas out, great systems out for people that they can just plug into and, and, and work with. People, all that they realize is they can hit play and watch a video, but they don't realize how much time and effort goes into yeah. creating that. And so I just want you to thank you for all the time and effort spent into creating that. Thank you. I learn from this guy every time I get a chance to consume and you should definitely be following Sharon if you're not. And T360, we're gonna do Probably an hour to an hour, 20 minutes. Yeah, you got it, man. All right, maybe an hour and a half, so get ready. You got it, man. Part Thank two, you. coming. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate you. Appreciate it.